So, welcome to this lecture of uh, digital system design with PLDs and FPGAs. Uh, we will have a quick run through the, uh, the last uh, lectures um, uh, part. In the last lecture we have seen the timing analysis of the controller, uh, how to go about designing the control algorithm um, using a state diagram and so on. So, a quick uh, run through the slide then we will start today's uh, part and we have looked at the, uh, the maximum clock frequency. We have to analyze two paths, one is a register to register path and the register to output path and we choose the maximum as the, as the minimum clock period and as I said that this output uh, can go to some other register through a combination circuit then one has to account uh, the whole path from this register to that register. But in the absence of that knowledge I have shown up till this point, but you have to keep that in mind. And similarly exactly like uh, the synchronous counter case, uh, the whole time violation is uh, this is the inequality, the TCQ plus T logic should be greater than the whole time, otherwise there will be whole time violation. And if there is a violation then you have to increase the delay of the logic so that uh, because as I said everything is we are analyzing with the same edge. So, it has got nothing to do with the clock frequency, but in the first case we are uh, our analysis is from one clock edge to the next clock edge. So, uh, if there is an issue if this is not satisfied you can increase the clock period or reduce the clock frequency you can solve it. So, whenever there is a um, slack uh, is negative the margin is negative you can uh, increase decrease the clock frequency or increase the clock period. But when there is a whole time violation you have to see uh, how to increase the combination delay in the path or do something else which we will see maybe some other uh, techniques maybe as we go along. And um, we have looked at the controller design and many a times when we design a controller we have uh, a text uh, kind of specification and from there we will have to derive some set of sequences then some waveform. Uh, but then there, there may be quite a lot of possibilities we have to work out and always humans are good at uh, using graphical tools. So, we use a graphical tool like flowchart called state uh, diagram which captures uh, the various steps in sequence or states and depending on the input its transition and in each step or state what are the outputs. So, that is basically what we are going to do. So, in a in a state diagram states are represented by oval or circle transitions are by arrows and output is associated in a block with this oval. Essentially we will be able to once you draw that we will be able to come out with the truth table of the next state logic and output logic after the state assignment. So, uh, we have seen some kind of unconditional transition going from one state to other state on next clock edge and here we have a transition depending on an input that means if uh, the machine is in this state or step when input is 1 it goes here input is 0 it is a branching condition and very other useful condition is that waiting for some signal to become active. So, here as long as this enable is not active you remain there the, the machine remain in the present state S0 and when that uh, becomes active it, it goes to the next state. Uh, both are conditional uh, transitions. Um, so, let us we have looked at the outputs we normally specify the output associated with the state and again in, in textbook cases sometime there is a habit of writing the output you know like input slash output and all that. This works for very kind of simple cases where there is only few inputs and few outputs, but when there are lot of outputs that cannot be done. So, it is better to write uh, separately. Uh, so, this is what is done here. So, in this state these, these are the output uh, signals. So, this is a direct decode of the state and in this state the read bar has become 0 and the latch has become 1. And in the case of Millet output we write. Uh, the output is a function of the input. In this case the input is same input is used for the transition condition, but as I said uh, earlier it need not be it can be another 
signal which is not an input to the to the state machine per se. Uh, so, that captures the kind of uh, the state diagram basics and we have looked at a multiplier kind of uh, state diagram um, controller for multiplier data path. And as I said normally like in software you come to a state where everything is inactive then wait for some signal then you come to another state initialize everything then come to a main computation state and iterate it through many clock cycles and when the, the, the computation is done you go back and wait for the, the next operation and uh, we have also seen that from the input and transition you can write the next state table and from the state and the, and the output each output we can write the output table. So, from this we have we have seen how to write the next state table and the moment you write that you can form equation for d1, d0, minimize it and so on. But in our case we write this diagram in, in some hardware description language and the tool does everything you know tool does the state assignment, tool does the uh, all these uh, minimization and all that. And the output table in our case is a function of the present state. So, four outputs we write as a function of the present state and then you can form equation for each output minimize it implement it. Again in our case we will write the state diagram in, in uh, describe the state diagram then the tool will take over and do all the kind of minimization and implement it and uh, that is it and, um, and I also said that uh, this is uh, this next state table and the output table is kind of equivalent to the state diagram because all the information for this is there. So, the moment you draw the state diagram the game is over the design is done rust is a kind of um, automatic process which the tools can do uh, very well. So, uh, with that I think uh, we will move to a case study uh, to basically uh, this case study is to kind of illustrate uh, the controller design than the data path design. We will we have seen at least the data path of the, the CPU. Uh, we will take the data path design uh, in, a, in a another case study when we kind of little more proceed further. Um, at this point the case study I will give more importance to the controller and as I said it is a simple case study. But it is it is realistic too. It is it can be used in real life. It is not that uh, you know something very simple. I cook up, and most often most textbook uh, show something like a traffic uh, light controller is a kind of uh, favorite example for uh, most uh, people because uh, because everybody experienced that case and and one knows all the specification and the, the clearly because from the kind of day to day life experience. But this whatever I am going to discuss also uh, for an engineer is a familiar uh, scenario very simple scenario. So, let us go to that uh, case study. So, the case study I have taken is a data acquisition system. So, in a normal uh, like you want to capture some analog signal and uh, take the digital samples and do some kind of um, say uh, digital signal processing on that is our uh, system ok. So, normally you have an ADC uh, maybe uh, a single channel multi channel uh, we do not care much about the number of channels, uh, but we assume that it is a quite a fast kind of ADC which captures um, high frequency analog signal ok. So, now normally the ADC is interface to a microprocessor or microcontroller some kind of microcontroller or microprocessor and uh, what is done is that the processor you know give uh, uh, the uh, tell the ADC to start the conversion then when it is done it is read through. Um, this example I worked out is little bit old maybe the present day interfaces are not parallel interface like I2C or SPA interface, but I am showing a parallel data interface from an ADC um, in this case, uh, but this can be translated to the whatever is the latest uh, um, interfaces available. But we, we are assuming that 
this particular processor is used for you know it is an embedded uh, system and the processor is kind of working on many things and now if ADC acquires sample and interrupt the processor every now and then like uh, suppose it is an uh, 12 bit ADC uh, every time uh, one sample is acquired or few samples are acquired if processor is kind of interrupted then everything slows down. So, our idea is that we design a controller or design a system where our controller will give the tell the ADC to do the start of conversion and when the ADC say it is done end of conversion is done we will store the sample somewhere in a temporary temporarily it will be stored in some place and when that storage is full we will interrupt the microprocessor and or the controller will interrupt the, the host uh, CPU uh, and the host CPU comes and in a burst okay uh, read the whatever was in the storage. So, that basically to kind of free the processor from kind of per sample overheads okay because uh, uh, if there is a uh, real time OS running on the processor these interrupts can be costly because uh, there is a task switching. Uh, to make this active and read in then continue with the other task. So, all that is avoided. So, that is a basic uh, scenario what we are going to do. So, I will put a picture. So, this is the and it is always better to write a picture but draw a picture which brings in clarity ok. So, we have an ADC as I said um, I am showing a bit old ADC with a kind of parallel interface and and uh, not a command through SPI or I2C. So, here uh, you have an analog clock analog input and there is a start of conversion to the to the ADC and uh, when ADC is completing the uh, you know the conversion it gives an end of conversion. Then the idea is that we put this data into a temporary storage and this is a host interface host will give a start signal to start all operation. And then we start this business you know continuously keep on converting and putting it to the storage. And when the storage is becoming full we interrupt uh, the system will interrupt the, the host and host will read the data the output of the storage uh, read the data using this host read signal. So, that is a basic idea. So, um, uh, we have to have a data path you know data path is very simple we need a temporary storage. So, we need to read the data from here uh, put it to a temporary storage and the, the output of the temporary storage goes to the host and all these control signal you know the start of conversion looking at the end of conversion uh, giving an interrupt and so on should be done by the controller or look at the start signal and so on ok. So, the question is uh, what is the best kind of uh, temporary storage and definitely it has to be a memory ok that is very clear. But um, you see that this memory uh, a normal static RAM if you put it has one address bus and one data bus ok. But this ADC side has to write and the host has to read ok. So, a single port uh, may not suffice in this case like if you have only one address bus and one data bus that has to be switched between both sides you know you need some kind of multiplexing and it can become complex. So, normally one would think that ok why not use a dual port RAM. So, in a dual port RAM you have two data buses and two address bus. So, we can use one um, kind of bus here uh, to write and one kind of bus here the second port to read ok. But if you think um, for a while uh, a RAM will allow a random access ok. That means, this uh, input side can write to any location and the output side can read from any location and it allows a uh, kind of other way I like from this side you can write and this side you can read. But in our case if you look at it the data flows only in one direction it does not flow in other direction. And we do not care about the random access and all that like we are getting the analog samples you put it in a sequence the first sample comes here, second sample here, third sample here and so on 
and the host need to read in the same sequence. It, it, there is no point in reading the fifth sample, seventh sample, second sample and so on. There is no random access, it is a one way flow. So, DPRAM is a costly solution, most of the features are not required. So, if you again if you know the various memory technologies the best solution for is that if you it is a one way flow and it is a first in first out kind of read like you write first and you whatever is written first is read first. So, what is required is a FIFO here okay that is ideal solution because FIFO you write in one side read from the other side and there is no addressing like addressing is implicit in a FIFO because there is a write address register on read address register or you can say a write pointer and a read pointer at the beginning both point to the first location. So, you start writing then it write pointer increments you start reading read pointer increments and definitely the read should not overtake the write and the write should not kind of come below like it should not overwrite. So, there are some control signal like empty full and all that FIFO gives to kind of synchronize that that means when it is empty you do not read when it is full you do not write and so on ok. But that is FIFO. So, the FIFO is the best solution in this case. So, let us try to put it and you know that the controller gets a clock and a reset. The controller has to give this start of conversion and when the end of conversion comes the controller should know that and the start signal uh, from the host should come to the controller to start the whole operation. And this FIFO need a write signal that has to be given by the controller and the, the FIFO this data can be connected to the data input of the FIFO. This data can be connected to the data output of FIFO and the read signal of the host will come to the, the FIFO read and how, how to give this interrupt signal ok. Now, the, the FIFO has various signals like full, half full and three fourth full and all that ok. Now, um, like if you, you have a full signal and if you connect that to interrupt it may be dangerous in the sense that when it becomes full you give the interrupt and the CPU has some OIS it does all the task switching. Uh, at least it has to before going to the interrupt service routine even if it is a simple system it takes quite a few clock cycle by the time it comes to read it it must have overwritten because we are continuously doing this operation suppose this, the host is not stopping it it will overwrite. So, it is very safe to use a 3 fourth full signal as interrupt. So, by the time the host comes here uh, then uh, the data is not you know the temporary storage is not yet full and nothing gets uh, lost in the process. So, that is a basic um, kind of block uh, diagram. So, let us look at it you know that is this is what I declare uh, I mean I have told the DP RAM you can put, but the random access we do not require it is a one way data flow DP RAM allows two way data flow and it is quite costly because of multiple ports and it is too complex for the application. The ideal solution is a FIFO. It is very simple to use the addressing is implicit and it is enough for the application. So, I have put whatever I have told ok. So, you have a controller which need a clock and a reset the start signal comes from the host start. So, when the host say start whole operation will start the, the start of conversion is given by the controller the, the FIFO write signal is given by the, the, the controller because controller knows when is the end of conversion coming here the end of conversion is coming to the controller then it will give the FIFO write that this data is connected to the data input. This output data is connected to the host interface the, the host read is connected to the FIFO read and 3 fourth full is given to the interrupt. So, that when it is 3 fourth full uh, the host can come and read the signal ok. Now, uh, we will make some assumptions. Or, um, so, one thing is that um, like when the interrupt come and the host comes and try to read it by the time maybe that we have uh, the controller has written or the ADC has written quite a bit of data more than the 3 fourth. So, the question is that 
uh, like we are not giving any other handshake signal like empty or full to the host make it keep it simple. So uh, the, the one question is that how much when an interrupt comes how much the host should read okay. So uh, we are not sure like but we are sure that when the 3 4th come the 75 percent is full. So let us assume when an interrupt comes the host will come and read less than or equal to 75 percent but fix like it will read 75 percent or it read 70 percent does not matter okay. So it will read somewhere around less than 75 percent all the every time the fixed amount okay. Uh, and uh, anyway that there will be something remaining which gets pushed um, when the new data comes again it gets filled and it comes and read the 75 percent okay. And maybe the last time you know the, the when the host top it and maybe there is some data remaining there we do not know how to empty it unless there is uh, you know uh, other handshake signal. So maybe that is okay like you say stop uh, you remove the start then um, uh, the interrupt comes uh, or interrupt does not come some data may uh, remain there uh, it is okay like we will lose some data at the, the last cycle um, once it is known this can be taken care there is no issue. So that is the first assumption we make when an interrupt comes uh, the host read uh, something fixed amount less than or equal to the 75 percent. Second assumption we make is that we will not impose any constraint on this start of conversion pulse that means that we say some kind of narrow pulse is given to the ADC that will work you know that is uh, one assumption we make and but uh, when you write to a memory write to a FIFO we need a definite width pulse width okay some minimum pulse width is required for write we will try to meet that okay. So these are the assumption we make one is regarding uh, when the interrupt comes how much to read the timing of the SOC pulse and the timing of the FIFO write signal okay. There is no much constraint on this as some narrow pulse will do but here you need a definite pulse width for FIFO to write okay. So that is assumption we make now uh, so that is written here uh, like host processor will read something less than or equal to 75 percent uh, the SOC is a narrow pass and frame write FIFO write signal timing has to be met correctly minimum it has to be maintained okay. Now what is the next step you know like we have put a block diagram. So the question is that what is the next step and uh, can we go to the uh, uh, kind of uh, control algorithm the state diagram uh, no I think the very important thing is that we have to draw the timing diagram. So the input and output relation from this description and referring to the, the various systems we use maybe you have to refer to the ADC data sheet to get the ADC timing we have to read the FIFO data sheet or FIFO we have to know like if you are designing the FIFO yourself you should know what are the, uh, the timing parameters of the FIFO. Then we draw a timing diagram showing the input output uh, timing waveforms so, so that is the next step. So let us write the timing diagram so I have shown the timing diagram in the slide. So here you know you have at the beginning the start is low or inactive so all the signals are inactive SOC is 0 end of conversion is kind of 0 and the, the FIFO write is high because it is an active low signal normally the write uh, signals are active low it is kind of uh, inherited from the, uh, the TTL kind of uh, logic because where uh, the, the you know the active high signal does not source much current and the active low signal is the one which is sourcing the current too. so most of the time the write is inactive so to reduce the kind of current uh, this was made inactive but with the CMOS that is not a big deal. But anyway this is kind of inherited from the previous technology. So if you look at that the timing diagram when the start goes high then the controller detects it and give a narrow start of conversion. The moment the start of conversion is given and this shows the continuity we do not know how long it take the end of conversion to come. So this shows some kind of 
um, continuity it may be it is continuing and then the end of conversion comes the moment the end of conversion comes the controller has to give a right signal of certain width uh, to the uh, to the FIFO and the FIFO gets written and we terminate the controller terminates FIFO right and after that again look at the start signal and if it is 1 then give the start of conversion and repeat the whole process. So that is a so this is the kind of iteration we do. Uh, this whole process starting here it is continued if the start signal is high at this point. So that is a basic um, um, kind of waveform and from where we derive uh, the control algorithm okay. But uh, the next question to ask is that how do we generate very precise timing uh, for this FIFO right okay. So here this start of conversion is a simple thing what we do is that. Uh, we come to a state at the beginning SOC was 0, we when the start signal come we can come to a state make SOC 1 and transit to another state and make SOC 0. So for one clock period duration when that state machine is in that state this SOC will be 1 and you get an arrow pulse okay. It depends on the clock frequency which we use for the controller but this pulse can be of one clock period duration. Um, if you want 2 clock period duration make SOC 1 for 2 states then you get 2 clock period duration. But we assume that there is no great constraint 1 state duration is good enough for this case. But the question is that how to generate a pulse of certain size okay. So taking Q from what I have described one way is like when the end of conversion comes go to one state make it low. Now if you know the clock period of the, the controller suppose it is uh, say the, the it is 5 nanosecond and you need 25 nanosecond width for the FIFO right then one thing to do is that uh, first come to a state where the FIFO right is low, transit to next state where FIFO right is low and go on doing that for the, the 5 clock period or 5 states then you will get a clean pass. But then this is quite uh, kind of cumbersome suppose uh, uh, we, we kind of updated this design with a faster FIFO then the state machine has changed the controller has to change maybe only 3 states are required instead of 5. So the question is that can we remove uh, this kind of timing um, from the implicit state which we add and move it elsewhere okay. Uh, a, a subsystem we add that will keep track of the, the kind of width of the timing pulse then it will be ideal because if there is a change in the width of the pulse we can modify that subsystem easily uh, maybe there is some flexibility uh, to do that. So that is what uh, uh, shown here so one uh, way of doing it is that controller is going through many states which match with the, the, the width of the, the right timing. Uh, it might occupy too many states and uh, modification is difficult like you, you get a slower or a faster FIFO then uh, you have to modify the state diagram and redesign the controller. So why not we use a counter we keep a counter okay. So what we do is that we keep a counter and when the end of conversion comes the it goes to a state and make the FIFO ride low and start the counter okay. Now wait for the counter to reach a particular count and that we can decode using a decoder and that signal is given, given to the controller and when that signal comes uh, we go to the, the state machine go to a particular state a new state and terminate this uh, this FIFO right is made 1. So this is more elegant because uh, uh, the counter uh, may be like we use a say 8 bit counter so it can choose various kind of count can be decoded okay. So you have a flexibility of choosing many counts many values and only the decoder need to change okay. If you at the beginning itself uh, depending on uh, some the range of the access time of the FIFO you choose a counter width to accommodate kind of all kinds of possible ranges in, in future then only the decoder need to change it is very simple 
decoder is many a times an AND gate with inverters. So, it is very simple to redesign. So, that is what we are going to do that. So, now I will show the modified uh, diagram with the with the subsystem. So, everything else remains same. Now, we have a counter uh, uh, which is outside this our data path and which is clocked by uh, maybe the same clock or a derived clock from here. Uh, normally, there is no reason to use any other clock than the the controller uh, maybe I will touch upon it why it is so. Uh, but um, yeah there is no need to use a, a lower clock than a, a controller clock because you, unless it is available in the system okay. Uh, if there is a lower clock than the controller is available you can use it otherwise uh, suppose this is 10 megahertz if you plan to use 1 megahertz anyway you need a clock divider which is nothing but a counter. So, that division can itself happen here okay not a big deal. So, and there is no point in using a higher clock than this because uh, this clock is lower uh, which will not be able to catch again we will discuss that uh, business later. Uh, and uh, you see the counter as a reset which goes from the output of the controller. So, normally uh, this counter is kept reset by the, the controller and we can use an enable for the counter also since we have not uh, kind of learned how to bring in enable and all that. Uh, I just keep a very simple scheme that is kept reset and when uh, the controller need this reset is removed that reset is uh, made 0 then it starts counting and uh, this is a decoder equal to time when you say equal to some fixed value it is a decoder and equal to a variable it is a comparator. So, when you see equal to some numerical value uh, do not think that it is a comparator because you know the comparator is an exclusive OR gate comparing. But when you say equal to 3 equal to 10 uh, it is nothing but uh, like if you say 4 lines are here you say equal to 10 means that it is decoding 1010 0, 0 pattern. So, you can imagine that uh, 1 then there is an inverter then 1 inverter going to an AND gate that output is going to the, the, the controller. So, the idea is that the controller gives the start of conversion it is waiting for end of conversion when it comes it does two things it makes this FIFO write low the counter reset is made low it was 1 it was kept reset and the counter starts counting and when when it reaches that uh, this particular uh, kind of pattern and that pattern is chosen um, so that it matches the, the FIFO write width and this gives a signal to the controller this goes high this was 0 and then it terminates this FIFO write and wait for the start again. So, that is a basic business. So, we added a subsystem now. So, what next step we have to do is that we have to kind of update the timing diagram okay that is very important all these are kind of most people uh, kind of uh, hate this kind of very systematic approach uh, they think that is very pedantic to draw, but if you do not draw uh, you can make mistake and in a complex design where multiple teams are working on um, kind of um, on a project uh, then um, if things small things can make a difference you integrate everything then you find some silly mistakes cropping up many a times in complex design the verification is done by somebody else. And um, it goes the full cycle it goes to the verifi verification then come back with a minor correction and lot of time is wasted if you do not plan things properly. So, anything complex you plan it properly take time to plan take time to go systematically then there is less uh, kind of debugging less kind of uh, errors cropping up. But only thing is that um, you may not see many things concrete um, uh, other than the paperwork uh, like uh, till towards the end of the end part of the project which can keep uh, some people tensed up in jittery, but you one need not worry uh, anything complex uh, the most activity will happen when um, towards the end of the, uh, the project. Then once you do everything plan properly bring things together. Uh, towards the end it becomes very quick neat 
uh, and easy integrating than you know kind of going through eternal cycles of uh, debug and iteration and things like that. It's not that you do not have to debug but then if you plan properly there will be less trouble uh, waiting for you at the end. So let us move on let us see the updated uh, timing diagram. So this is the uh, let us turn to the slide. So uh, everything remains same you have uh, the when the start comes the start of conversion is given by the controller wait for end of conversion and essentially this is the conversion time from the start of conversion to end of conversion and then the controller does two things uh, the FIFO write is made low and the reset is made low and the counter starts counting and the controller wait for this write time signal okay. The write with time signal when it goes out from the decoder the reset is put back so that the counter is reset and uh, inactive and the FIFO write is, is made uh, inactive by making it 1. Then again uh, check for the start and if it start is 1 start the start of conversion and whole, whole thing repeats okay. So we have come to a kind of good point uh, to derive the, the control algorithm and looking at this waveform you can derive the control algorithm. It is very easy. Now let us derive the control algorithm by looking at the, the timing diagram. So like let the state machine come to a starting state okay and all the signal all the output signals are inactive SOC is 0 this is the input signal FIFO write is 1 reset is 1 and this this uh, uh, these two signals are the input to the sorry output of the uh, like uh, sorry input to the uh, the state machine so which is which is what is looked for transition so and even the start uh, end of conversion and this write time is input the soc fifo write and the the c uh, counter reset is are the outputs maybe I could have put different colour but then anyway uh, you understand that. Now uh, so we are in a starting state with this inactive condition SOC uh, FIFO write and counter reset is inactive and at the start uh, state we are waiting for the start signal. So that means the start signal is low remain in that state the same state the starting state and if the start signal is 1 transit to the next state upon the clock period clock uh, active clock edge transit to the next state and make SOC 1 okay. Now we said we need a, a narrow pulse so way to generate is that next clock period transit to a third state and make SOC 0. So you get uh, out of the controller you get a pulse SOC 1 clock period duration pulse uh, as SOC pulse then uh, the ADC start you know converting then the state machine is in the third state where the SOC was made 0 at the same state it wait for the end of conversion to become high that means remain there like a wait and go uh, uh, remain there as long as end of conversion is low. When the end of conversion comes high go to another state okay and make this uh, FIFO write low and the counter reset low. Now the counter starts counting so at this state what it can do is that it remains as long as this signal is low. So it is waiting for write time signal to go high so if it is low remain there and when it comes high go to the next state and make it 1 and FIFO write is 1. Uh, but you know that that next state can be the starting state itself because if you look at in this state the start of conversion is 0 uh, FIFO write is kind of 1 reset is 1 so which is equivalent which is same as the starting state so we can go back to the starting state. So that is the control algorithm so looking at the waveform one can derive the control algorithm you can write it in words so once again uh, starting state make the output inactive wait for the start signal when the start signal come transit to a new state make the SOC 1 transit to another state make SOC 0 wait for end of conversion when the end of conversion comes transit to another state 
make the FIFO right low, the counter reset low, wait for the uh, you know right time when it comes high go to the starting state and the whole thing is repeated. So, that is the control algorithm you can write it down uh, upon reset come to an init state wait for start initialize the output to inactive upon the start go to next state make SOC 1 then do not wait for anything transit to next state make SOC 0 so that SOC is 0 here 1 here 0 here. So, you get 1 clock period pulse here and wait for end of conversion to become 1 and then upon end of, end of conversion transit to next state start the counter make it 0 uh, make FIFO write active and wait for this right time signal to go 1 when it becomes 1 go to the starting state. So, very simple very very clear and you might wonder that in a complex case writing this is it worth uh, I would say writing is worth because many a times uh, writing allows you to think as you write as you draw waveform uh, you tend to ask questions uh, some questions come to my come to the mind and you will be able to address that. But if you most people what they do is that either they do not draw the waveform and start writing the code okay, uh, from the head and that is prone to mistake. But anything you write it down uh, the mind works if you are thinking and the logical something logical is missing it comes to the mind and then um, it can kind of you can sort it out okay. Uh, even uh, sometime discussing telling the same thing whatever is known to another person uh, sometime the process of telling uh, brings this question to the mind or sometime a innocuous uh, question from the whoever is listening maybe uh, they, they have not understood things properly, but a doubt a, a clarification can trigger some answers to your mind. So, it is very important that you work on the, uh, the paper uh, discuss uh, sometimes speak aloud. So, that uh, these things come to the mind okay of course, this is not my kind of topic it is something to do with the cognition, but then that is related to education that is why I am I am pointing it out. Uh, because people shy away from this kind of simple steps and waste a lot of time um, and it is very costly many a times uh, whatever maybe you have a, a public limited company uh, kind of designing a chip, but that is uh, the money of the shareholders and, and if you make a mistake uh, if you do not meet the deadline lot of money is wasted it is do not think that it is uh, your company's money your money it is the people's money. So, that you have to be responsible as an engineer many a times you do not feel responsible sometime a doctor is treating a patient and one thing that is the doctor is a medical doctor is a kind of more has more responsibility than an engineer, but I think engineers should uh, you know kind of uh, understand that we are responsible for um, the, the problem we are solving how efficiently we are solving, how cost effectively we are solving. Uh, very rarely that a, an, a system which is designed by an engineer fails in the field and the engineer is you know kind of drawn to litigation. Many a times it does not happen, but it happens in the, the medical profession. So, uh, one has to keep this as a work ethic uh, to, to kind of address these issues. So, let us move to the state diagram now to implement uh, the control uh, algorithm we have implemented uh, like we have written down. So, let us look at the whatever we have discussed how to draw the state diagram. So, uh, let us move on to the slide. Uh, so, see at the at the power on you come to a starting state okay, a 0. Then at that state we make the signals inactive. This is the starting state signals are inactive SOC 0 FIFO write is 1 counter is reset 1 ok. So, that is the output of that state more outputs and then here we are waiting for the start signal. If start signal is low remain there, if start signal is 1 go to next state and we know that we have to make SOC 1 rest all is uh, remain same SOC is made 1. Now, we transit to next state because we want a pulse on SOC and SOC is made 0 rest all things are uh, you know um, same 
and here the, the, the ADC is converting start converting. So, we wait for the end of conversion. So, if end of conversion is low we remain there upon the end of conversion we go to the next state and what we have to do is that we have to give the FIFO write signal we have to start the counter and that is what we do FIFO write signal is uh, active the counter is active the counter is counting. So, we are waiting for the decoder output to come. So, the write time is low then remain there write time is high go back because then everything is remain same and wait for the start signal ok. So, um, you should like simple uh, come to start uh, you know starting state make SOC 0 wait for start signal to become active when it becomes active come to next state make SOC 1 go to next state SOC 0 wait for end of conversion when it comes start the counter FIFO write is active wait for the decoder output and when it comes come to the starting state and uh, you know repeat if the start is low. So, one thing is that you see we are kind of looking at the start signal only at this state. So, it is a very good thing you know it is uh, the logic becomes simple because if you are looking at the start signal every state uh, the, the next state logic will become complex, but it has a beautiful advantage saying that we started the whole you know start of conversion process even if the start goes low in between we do not care whatever was started is completed. So, sometime um, making keeping things simple will result in very elegant uh, solution like uh, that is evident in the timing diagram like here since we are only looking at the start at the beginning even if it goes in between we are not stopping anything we are completing it and then stopping the whole game ok. So, uh, keeping simplicity sometime can result in uh, really elegant solution uh, which sometime people will boast uh, saying that even if halfway the start is uh, become inactive our system make sure that it is completed and solved. But we know that it is a very simple decision which has resulted in some elegance and here then we have 4 states. Uh, so, uh, we have we can do binary encoding we number of flip flops are 2 then we can do the state assignment because to, to develop uh, the next state table and the output table we need to know what kind of flip flops we are using uh, for the transition and uh, how many flip flops and so on. So, what is the state of the flip flops. So, we will assign S000, S101, S210, S311 and we will use D flip flop you know that if you use a JK flip flop we can use that maybe we can see that later, but we assume the D flip flops are used so that uh, the transition is same as whatever you want to transit same thing you give it to the D then you get the, the proper transition. So, now we are able to write the uh, next state table and the output table from the state diagram I hope uh, the state diagram you remember. So, we move on so do not forget this is the finite state machine you have two flip flops here giving the present state and the input comes and depending on the input and present state we are you know from the state diagram we are deciding this and in each state we are using output logic uh, you know creating output by output logic. In our case it is all are more output so there is no kind of uh, this line is not necessary. So, let us uh, develop the next state table. So, next state table you have a present state as input the real input as inputs ok to the next state table. So, we write the next state as a function of the present state and input. So, at the beginning 0 0 if start is 0 these are do not care remain there if start is 1 go to the next state 0 1. In the 0 1 irrespective of the condition transit to third state 1 0 and in 1 0 we are waiting for end of conversion as long as it is low remain there 1 0. If it is 1 uh, you know 1 0 is transiting to 1 1 and uh, in the 1 1 state we are waiting for the right time decoder and if it is kind of 0 remain there if it is 1 go to the starting state. So, that is symbol and we can form the min terms of D1 and D0 minimize it get the equation. So, D1 and D2 are the function of the present state and the inputs the design is done 
and the similarly uh, the output table we can develop you have the present state output uh, 3 output and in the first state the SOC is 0 raster 1 in the next state SOC is 1 raster 1 in the third state we make uh, SOC 0 uh, and then the end of conversion start of conversion has happened and in the last state we are making the reset and the, the FIFO write active that is all and the output can be you know the equations can be formed minimized and so on. So, the here the outputs are a function of the present state that is what is shown. So, the, the whole process of designing I have shown. So, let us recapture that uh, the whole process uh, in steps so that um, you know clearly what is happening. So, the, the design methodology we have used we have started with the specification uh, which was written like a, a set of spec. Um, then we drew a block schematic of the block diagram and signal and we kind of uh, argued for some block like temporary storage what is the temporary storage and so on. So, basically there is a data path which is the FIFO and the controller. So, in a complex design the data path is quite can be complex and then third step was that we have drawn a system timing diagram. Then some question crop, cropped up whether how to meet some timing diagram. So, we have timing requirement and we need to put a counter. So, we had some subsystem to, to meet the timing then we have updated the timing diagram ok. Then we have described uh, of course, we have to do the data path design we have assumed the FIFO design is done ok. We have not attacked that, but ultimately you have to design the FIFO 2 in this case or use a FIFO as a, as a block from somewhere or you have to literally design the FIFO. So, data path has to be designed and in a complex case you have to go through a hierarchy top down design. Then we have developed the controller algorithm from the timing diagram then we you know kind of the draw drew the state diagram and after that we have optimized ok. In our case we did not do much of an optimization, but there was an optimization like if you remember uh, from the last state we said we could go to uh, another state and make things inactive then we realize that instead of going to a fifth state you can go back to the init state because those are equivalent ok. So, in a complex case this may not be obvious you have a lot of states and there could be some states somewhere in the in the state diagram which are kind of equivalent and that can be brought together ok. So, that is state diagram optimization you can remove the redundancies and we will see how these are done by the tools, but what are the kind of algorithm to use uh, to detect the redundancy and so on. So, there is a step in state diagram optimization then we have to do the state assignment after optimizing it you have to assign uh, the, uh, the state assignment we have to do the selection of flip flops uh, what type of flip flops are used. And then we have to develop the next state table depending on the flip flops uh, form the equation minimize it output table equation minimize then ultimately we have to choose some device technology and implement it. So, implement it then things will not go work uh, at the beginning you have to debug it uh, if something you feel that something is working uh, at the beginning. Um, there is something wrong with you wrong with the whole thing something has to go wrong ok. It is better things go wrong because at least in the learning process you can uh, debug and learn uh, things is not that you need not plan, but then uh, it is better you know something goes wrong. So, that you can learn things well and ultimately you have to document it this is what you know I do not know why I am talking about documentation, but then uh, be it in academy, academia or industry one need to document everything properly. So, that uh, the, the people who are coming afterwards can uh, follow it through. So, uh, these are the steps uh, which is now you realize that some of these, these things are done by the, the, the tools ok. So, let us look at it if you look at it all these things has to be done by the designer this is where the maximum uh, creativity is required you know you have to come out with an architecture data path then identify subsystem draw the timing diagram come out with the data path design come out with the control algorithm draw the state diagram. 
then you can describe that in hardware description language. All these can be done by the tool say up to here uh, the tool can do it and you need to give some directive to the tool. And test and debug you can use some equipments um, uh, to do the test and de uh, you know debug and documentation. Maybe the tool can help you with some report for documentation. So steps 1 to 8 is done by the designer, 9 to 13 is you know done by the tool and the directives and uh, the next steps is done, done by some tools or equipments and the designer. So I have taken you through a whole uh, you know case study uh, starting with a, a, a specification we have seen how to automate uh, offload the processor by a design uh, a data acquisition system. Basically we have described the system came out with the block diagram, uh, the ADC, the host controller and the temporary storage we have chosen FIFO and then we have interconnected that then we have put the timing diagram then we have identified the subsystem updated the timing diagram and we have derived a control algorithm drawn the state diagram and we have developed the next state table and the output table. You wrote down the all process all the steps in the design process the initial part up to the state diagram data path design and the controller design is done by the, the designer where the maximum creativity that is where you have to spend time. Then you should know the tools you know the, to, to know it well and we will, we will learn uh, about the tools and uh, uh, then proceed test and debug and document it. So um, we have been learning how to design the data path and the controller. There are lot of timing issues various issues in the controller to discuss and the data path design. But for the time being I will stop the digital design part and we will in the next lecture onwards uh, we will have the basics of the VHDL. So that you are able to describe the combination circuit and sequential circuit of some complexity using the hardware description language. Then we will come back to this issue so that uh, the design and the, and the VHDL can go hand in hand. So, Next uh, quite a few lectures uh, we will go through the VHDL part. So uh, please revise whatever I have done uh, till now uh, for whatever reason I am sure that you will be uh, you know uh, seeing this video course but there is no point uh, if you mechanically go through the uh, lecture after the lecture uh, like leisurely without working yourself. So please revise work yourself learn it well. Uh, so that at the end of when once you go through the complete course you are a master in the subject. So I wish you all the best and thank you.